Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Good morning to everyone joining us by live stream. Today is the first day of the ecclesiastical year. It's also called induction. Do you know why the first day of September marks the beginning of the church year? We are accustomed to think of January 1st as the beginning of the year, but the tradition of computing the start of a new year with autumn was common in the lands of the Bible and to all the lands around the Mediterranean. The summer harvest was at an end, the crops were stored, and people prepared for a new agricultural cycle. It was an appropriate time to begin a new year. Many of the hymns for the first day of the church end of the church year state that the coming that the coming year is God's to give and to God's to bless the year of the Lord. These hymns take their theme from Psalm 65, a song of praise to the Creator, who is awesome as the Holy Lord, but who richly sustains the earth with his abundant goodness. The prayers and hymns of the Orthodox Church not only recite the wonderful works of God in creation and history for our salvation, but also frequently offer guidance about how to make each year a year of grace, a year of the Lord. For example, the very first hymn of the new liturgical year chanted at Vespers in the joyful first poem reminds us that prayerful daily dependence on God is the basic attitude of the Christian and the Christian life. This hymn is also interesting because it refers to another key passage in the Bible that addresses all the faithful that says, O faithful, having learned the true prayer from the very words of divine teachings of Christ, talking about this on Sunday. Let us cry out to the Creator each day. Our Father who dwells in heaven, give us always daily bread and forgive our transgressions. The teachings of Christ are the source of truth for our lives. Our Father in heaven is a personal, personal God who provides for all our material and spiritual needs as we ask Him by faith. Daily prayer is the only way of ongoing communication and a vital relationship with God. Prayerful daily dependence on God sanctifies every moment of the day, whether we are at work, at play, at rest, or in difficulty. It fills us with the presence of God and makes it God's moment. We call that living in the present. Can't do it without God. Christ's good, good news demands our faithful response of mind, heart, and soul, and body. The unconditional love of God, shown by the most precious gift of His Son, who shed His blood on the cross for our salvation, requires a total response on our part. St. Simeon the Stylite, whose feast day is observed on the first day of the church year, this year, is an example of unwavering devotion. St. Simeon, for many years, lived on top of a pillar, a stilos, a style. Therefore, he is called the first that's why he's called the stylite. He lived in prayer, sustained by the power of God and little else. His ascetic witness was not only a radical denial of all earthly things, but also a provocative pointer to the kingdom of God. So he lived on the pillar of the style for 47 years. When I first heard of this, I could not comprehend it. I remember my reaction. I simply could not comprehend it. Why would anybody do anything like this? Which is totally outside my realm of, of awareness, certainly my realm of experience. <clears throat> Until I became Orthodox and then I learned about the ascetical tradition. And he was an extreme ascetic and his extreme asceticism also gave him great power. He would heal people by his prayers. So the pagans who lived around him, around him, he was, Christianity was just, just beginning then, would see his witness, would see the power of his prayers, would see his extreme asceticism, would see his moral fervency, and they were brought to God by it. By putting before St. Simeon's example of extreme asceticism at the beginning of the liturgical year, the Lord shows how seriously it takes a priority of Christ and how uncompromising our faith is about worldly values. I would add another thing too, because we have to learn this. We all, we all have to become more ascetical in our own life, more disciplined in our own life, 
especially in this world where everything is catered to the body, makes us weak, makes us weak if we go that route. There has to be self-denial, there has to be self-discipline. Otherwise, there's no progress in Christ. I will show you my faith by my works. By St. Simeon, not me, St. Simeon. There is no merrymaking or party revelry on the eve of the beginning of the new church year. It is an eve which does not call for wine and song, but for contemplation, reflection, and prayer. It is a time to pause and refresh the spirit and meditate on the new year before us. It is also a suitable time as Orthodox Christians to recommit our lives to God. Tradition also has it that when Jesus first read in the synagogue, the first time he stepped into the synagogue, which was really his public ministry, and he read the prophecy of Isaiah concerning himself, and he concludes with this beautiful phrase, Today the word is fulfilled in your hearing, because the one of whom Isaiah prophesied was the one speaking to them. And the next three years would be filled with signs, wonders, and great tumult, ending in a crucifixion and a resurrection. That happened on the beginning of the new year, because the Jewish calendar, the new year, is the old practice of September 1st, not January. Um, and a few words about St. Simeon. He was born in the Cappadocian village of Sison of Christian parents named Sisokhan and Martha. At 13 years of age, he began to tend his father's flock of sheep. He devoted himself attentively to this with love and obedience, a lot like King David. Once after hearing the Beatitudes in church, he was struck by their profundity. Not trusting his own immature judgment, he turned, therefore, with his questions to an experienced elder. The elder readily, readily explained to the boy the meaning of what he had heard. The seed fell on good soil and then strengthened his resolve to serve God. When Simeon was 18, he received monastic tonsure and devoted himself to the feast, feast of the strictest abstinence and unceasing prayer. His zeal beyond the strength of the other monastic brethren so alarmed the, the head of the monastery that he told Simeon that to either moderate his ascetic deeds or leave the monastery. St. Simeon then withdrew from the monastery and lived in an empty well in the nearby mountains where he was able to carry out his austere struggles unhindered. After some time, angels appeared in a dream to the elder of the monastery, who commanded him to bring back Simeon to the monastery. The monk, however, did not remain long in the monastery. After a short while, he settled into a stony cave situated not far from the village of Galanisa, where, and he dwelt there for three years, while, the, while perfecting himself in monastic feasts. Once he decided to spend the entire 40 days of great Lent without food or drink, with the help of God, the monk endured the strict fast. From that time, he has abstained from food completely during the entire period of great Lent, even from bread and water. For 20 days he prayed while standing, and for 20 days while sitting, so as not to permit the corporeal powers to relax. Um, see, I'll tell you what's behind this. Not everyone is called to this, but some people are, some men are. And in the fasting and in the physical endurance, what happens is the devil attacks and he attacks fiercely. And so the abstinence provides a context, context within which he wars with the devil. But his warring with the devil defeats the devil, and consequently they're given great <coughs> powers by God, powers to heal, foresight, great wisdom. And they're chosen by God for this. They're chosen by God for this because two reasons. The rest of us need them. We need them. The world is very complex. Christian life sometimes is very difficult. We have to have wiser people to go to, to give us instruction. And we have them. 
But the reason they're wiser is because they've been called to this kind of life. It's a monastic life. Not all monks are like this, but some are. And they become elders, and they become teachers. Secondly, it's a little more abstract, but it's very true. Secondly, what, what prevents the darkness from overcoming the earth is the prayers of the faithful. What prevents the darkness from overcoming the earth is the prayers of the faithful. And the more purified the heart, the stronger the prayer. And so these men pray for the salvation of, of the world all the time. Just, when, just as when we pray, darkness is defeated. But these men have a, have a great strength. It doesn't absolve us of responsibility. Our prayer joins to theirs. But that's also a reason for this particular calling in the lives of Saint, some men like St. Simeon. Reports of St. Simeon reached the highest church hierarchy and the imperial court, Patriarch Dominos of Antioch, visited the monk, celebrated divine liturgy on the pillar, and communed the ascetic with the holy mysteries. Elders living in the desert heard about St. Simeon, who had chosen a new and strange form of ascetic striving, wanting to test the new ascetic and determine whether his extreme ascetic feats were pleasing to God. They sent messengers to him who in the name of these desert fathers were to bid Saint Simeon to come down from the pillar. In the case of disobedience, they were to forcibly drag him to the ground, but if he was willing to submit, they would leave him on the pillar. Saint Simeon dis displayed complete obedience and deep Christian humility. The monks told him to stay where he was, asking God to be his helper. They needed to test him to find out if this was authentic. He was an authentic monk, he would obey his elder. So they went to him and said, your elder says you have to leave the pillar. And he said, yes, I will leave. And because he said that, they, they knew he wasn't doing it out of pride or some kind of, some kind of spiritual disturbance of one kind or another. And then they said he's authentic and they gave their blessing to continue. St. Simeon endured many temptations, and he invariably gained victory over them. He relied not on his own weak powers, but on the Lord himself, who always came to help him. The monk gradually increased the height of the pillar on which he stood. The final, final pillar was 80 feet in height. Around him, a double wall was raised, which hindered the unruly crowd of people from coming too close and disturbing his prayerful concentration. This is always a paradox when the people of great and deep spiritual insight. They have to get away in order to fight the devil and undergo that deep purification of their soul. But as the light in them grows shiner, they attract, grows brighter, they attract people. Happened to St. Anthony the Great, the first monastic. And he just went deeper, deeper, deeper into the desert, but people kept following him. That's what happens, because we need, we need the counsel, that's why. Women in general were not permitted to bite beyond the wall. The saint did not make an exception even for his own mother, who after long and unsuccessful searches finally succeeded in finding her lost son. He, saint Simeon spent 80 years in arduous monastic feasts, 47 of which he stood on the pillar. Many pagans accepted baptism struck by the moral strongness and bodily strength which the Lord bestowed upon his servant. The first one to learn of the death of the saint was his close disciple named Anthony, concerned that his teacher had not appeared to the people for three days. He went up on the pillar and found the dead body stooped over at prayer. Patriarch Martyrios of Antioch performed the funeral before a huge throng of the clergy and the people, and they buried him near his pillar at the place of his ascetic deeds, Anthony established a monastery upon which rested the special blessing of Saint Simeon. And Anne, I know you have a personal experience with this because you actually went to the area where Saint Simeon was in Jordan a couple of years ago. And I'm going to find that email, I'm going to send it out again because it's so interesting. It actually shows a picture of 
not of his power in particular, but of the power of his type, which is the oldest one in existence, as I would call it. Very interesting. So through the prayers of St. Simeon, may the Lord have mercy on us and save us. Amen.